What is without doubt and beyond debate is that his family had a stellar role to play in the look and feel of New Delhi as we know it. When the British shifted capital from Calcutta to Delhi, they contracted the building of much of Latin's Delhi to the grandfather and father of Kushwan Singh, Sujan Singh and his son Soba Singh. The legacy continued from the builders of Delhi to Kushwan Singh, who too built up Delhi's heritage in a more intangible manner, the wordsmith whose daily columns everyone woke up to. Let us now get into the intricacies of Delhi's structure, its growth from the times of Toma Rajput in the 12th century to Mughals and the British period. I invite Swapna Little, who has covered it all in her book, Connaught Place and the Makings of New Delhi, and her other book, Chandni Chowk, The Mughal City of Old Delhi. And joining uh, Swapna is Jayas Tirotsa, who gave us Delhi Darshan, the history of monuments of India's capital. Please come at the stage. which uh, Sadia uh, uh, pointed out, he would remember that Ghalib also once wrote a letter to some, you know, somebody who had written a letter to him and addressed the envelope in a very convoluted manner, giving the name of the Mahalla and the Kucha and everything. And he said, okay, you know, you don't need to write all this. I'm so well known that uh, just writing Ghalib Dilli is good enough. It will come to me. So he was quite irritated by that. So I think I, I, I really like the parallels there. Uh, I, uh, uh, one of the things I remember much before I wrote this book was a talk that Kushwan gave in his inimitable style. Uh, uh, there was a series of lectures, uh, basically Sova Singh Memorial lectures, which were held in which he uh, gave this lovely talk 
saying my father the builder and that uh, i think got published later also in uh, madhatayal's edited book uh, celebrating delhi and he uh, gave uh, you know a lot of the what we know about the building of delhi uh, comes you know a lot of what people popularly know about the building of delhi comes from uh, that little talk that he gave in fact of that Uh, so uh, what i thought was that given the limited amount of time we have today and uh, i hope you will go into and you probably read other books on delhi so i'm not going to give you a history of that but just show a few pictures of uh, well the first one is up there and uh, of uh, so, some aspects which people probably don't realize it's not very old history but we often tend to just not know or uh, revisit what delhi was like what was this process of putting it uh, you know uh, uh, construction of new delhi what did it mean really and goshwant of course said that uh, you know i have not studied the history of delhi i have just heard this from uh, my father from other people these are anecdotes which i am now recalling so uh, i i really like the fact that i did, i myself then went later and did a proper uh, i did delve into the records and i came up with the story of the making of new delhi but uh, here are some pictures which uh, some of them appeared in the book but uh, uh, these are uh, amazing photographs so this is a uh, something from which shows you delhi before new delhi was built this is the view from Hawaii's tomb. It's the view from Hawaii's tomb, looking westwards, and you can see the area which is now uh, Nizamuddin, um, so Nizamuddin West and beyond. And you can see what kind of land it was. It was all strewn with uh, ruins. So this is this is from the 1870s. I think this picture is Samuel Bourne. Um, could we have the next one, please? This is what is today. Um, it, it's Lodi Garden. There's a bridge in Lodi Garden, a uh, Akbar Ira bridge, and uh, this is really what it was. It's uh, what you see in this picture is the bridge with um, a farmland beyond, and you can. Uh, it's not very clear, but it's clearly been farmed, and you can see uh, the stacks of um, the uh, hay, etc. Also, so it's it's. This was the village of Khairpur, and the village of Khairpur was then resettled. The houses were demolished, and it became Lodi Garden. Next, please. Um, the other thing that often people forget is that a lot of the monuments that we see today, Humayun's tomb, Lodi Garden, of course, I showed you. Uh, there is, uh, they look very different when New Delhi started to be built, and that's. it's not very long ago it's uh, barely 100 years uh, old this photograph is in fact probably exactly 100 years old because it's from the uh, the archaeological survey of india uh, took this photograph you can see in the background humayun's tomb again and this is the area that we today know as arab ki sarai and arab ki sarai was a a uh, proper you know a whole settlement with its own post office and everything in fact one of the records in the uh, delhi state archives is a file which deals with the shutting down of the post office of arab ki sarai because it had been the uh, the address ceased to exist they actually obliterated the uh, village the, or the small suburb altogether so this is arab ki sarai and the asi just uh, sort of you know as part of the building of new delhi was this whole thing of uh, monumentalizing some of these buildings like humayun stone uh, next please similarly purana kila this is a building you will recognize the tall building is what is known as vijay mandal it's the incidentally the building uh, from the roof of which uh, or down the stairs of which humayun Uh, fell and met his, uh, you know, that had suffered mortal injuries. Uh, that's also completely filled with houses. This was the village of Indar Pat, uh, which which is what, in fact, the the strongest uh, evidence that we have that this may have been the old Indar Pat that we hear of. So uh, just as the name Indar Pat 
and this long uh, sort of tradition. So this was the village of Indapath. You see it as a very interesting moment when a uh, lot of the roofs have been taken off. So uh, when the, this land was acquired by the government, the owners were told you can take away certain things like, you know, the woodwork, etc. A lot of them took away the woodwork. The, the building material was usually left. So the bricks and stones and those bricks and stones actually provided the raw material for a lot of the building of things like boundary walls and um, the roads. A lot of the roads of New Delhi were um, this stone that, uh, so in fact uh, there was a huge saving of in, on the stones account by just by recycling this material and in fact this is an interesting thing to remember that through the centuries when you've had different sites being used as New Delhi, or oh, sorry, as new capitals of Delhi, invariably there has been a lot of recycling of older materials from the previous sites. Next please. Um, this is something that I thought would be of interest. What did Raisina Hill actually look like? Very few of us didn't appreciate that. So to us, Raisina Hill is the finished uh, you know, product with the with uh, the secretariats and the Rashtrapati Bhavan. But what was it like really as Raisina Hill? So this is the uh, part you see of Raisina Hill being flattened on top and, uh, you know, sort of made fit to put those buildings on. It's a fabulous picture. And you can see, of course, the railway lines that are leading up to it also to, um, you know, cart the material away and to from it. Uh, next, please. Uh, just some of the, these are all photographs of the time when New Delhi was being built. So just assembled a few of them together. Uh, a combination of animal power, uh, sort of machines being used to do the work. Next please. Uh, railway lines, dedicated railway lines were set up to transport the material. Next. Uh, again, the construction site, a lot of cutting of stone, cranes being used, uh, again, tracks to transport the enormous amount of material, uh, enormous amount of stone that was transported. Next, please. Uh, this is something, this is, uh, I'm afraid you may not be able to see this very well, but it is, it shows Old Delhi, which is in black, that's Shahjanabad, uh, the 17th century city. And below that, in red, the plan of New Delhi. And uh, when I look at this, one uh, particular mystery, I think, begins to clear itself. Because what we all are often told is that Rajpath was laid out between what we call Rashtrapati Bhavan now and Purana Kela. So now the question is, if they were trying to align this road to Purana Kela, why uh, why didn't they do a better job of it? I mean, you know, uh, the way it uh, stands today, Rajpath just kind of, it, it's like at the very, very north uh, western tip of Purana Kila. You know, why not more fill, fully align it to maybe one of the gates? And I think the answer may lie in the alignment of that those particular two cities because Rajpath is absolutely parallel to the road which we know as Chandni Chowk. So uh, that uh, was a sort of an interesting tidbit that I thought uh, I should put out there. Uh, I'm open to <laughs> uh, different opinions on that. Uh, next please. Again, this is a picture which uh, I think more people are aware of this, that this statue of George V stood under the canopy uh, till the mid-60s. It's only in the 1960s that this was taken away and after some sort of protest had happened that you know why do you have a, a colonial symbol like this in the middle of India Gate so uh, but it did stand there till then. Uh, this is a statue which probably fewer people uh, uh, would remember or be aware of. This is the statue of the Viceroy under whom the first transfer of capital took place and a lot of the planning stages of the project uh, were executed under him, uh, Harding. And Harding's statue stood right in front of the Jaipur column. The Jaipur column is this uh, big pillar which is in front of Rashtrapati Bhavan. And uh, it was his uh, statue which actually stood there. And apparently the pedestal had a uh, uh, 
uh, you know, so the, the great contribution of Harding, because again, this is something that, uh, you know, I don't have enough time to go into that. But Harding, in fact, was responsible for a lot of the important decisions that were taken regarding the making of New Delhi, which included, in fact, placing Rashtrapati Bhavan on top of Dry So, that is one of them. Uh, Central Vista, we are discussing the Central Vista once again. Uh, you, uh, you know, all of us uh, probably are aware of uh, recent plans that have been announced to redevelop, to uh, re-landscape. We have to wait and see what happens here, but I thought uh, this picture kind of uh, really uh, evokes that uh, what Central Vista is all about. It is a vista. It's a big open, and this is of course early on in its career when the trees were much smaller. But and it is, uh, but uh, in many ways it is still quite unchanged, and it remains to be seen to what extent we can keep it unchanged. Uh, next, please. Um, India Gate with the first Republic Day celebrations happening. So uh, early in the morning, the president visiting uh, the, uh, the memorial there. So uh, all yeah, these, yeah. of course, the buildings, including the memorial arch, and, uh, have all been reconfigured uh, for uh, Indian use. We, we are, it's now uh, said capital of an independent nation, and these have been put to uh, new uses uh, or related uses. Next, please. Uh, again, I thought this is probably a memory that few would have. Um, the Republic Day parade passing through Connaught Place. This is, I think, 56, uh, or maybe a little earlier. Might be 52, actually. But uh, it's the Republic Day parade going through Connaught Place. Uh, next, please. And uh, this is something that, uh, I mean, I'm going to end with this. It's um, the Supreme Court. And a building like the Supreme Court, of course, was built after independence in the 50s. Uh, but here, too, the legacy of how uh, how New Delhi had been planned, the architecture of New Delhi, it's very, very much uh, a part of that same kind of um, aesthetic, the same kind of look that was being carried up forward in the form of these post-independence buildings like Supreme Court. So um, that I'm going to uh, sort of wrap it up here, this quick slideshow through some of uh, early New Delhi's uh, photographs, and I'm going to give this to Giles now. Could we change the um, PowerPoint, please? So one of the great pleasures of writing about Delhi um, is the fantastic range of architectural moments that you can focus on. And in my short book, I have actually covered a thousand years of, of, of building. There are wonderful moments, particularly for things, things like um, the Lodi period um, and the, the Mughal period, obviously, and New Delhi, as you've just seen. So can I have the first image, please, the next, the next one? Um, so I'm going to follow on um, from um, where Swapna left off with, 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 with the Supreme Court. And in, in my book, a section at the end focuses on the decade of the 1980s because I've always made it a point in writing about architectural history to, to make the point that architectural history doesn't end. You know, we still, we still produce buildings, we still produce really quite fine ones in some cases. Um, and I think that the 1980s was a particularly exciting era, um, especially in Delhi, across much of India, but especially in, in Delhi. And it's a happy coincidence that it was also the decade in which Kushwan Singh published his novel, Delhi. Um, so on that thin thread, I shall hang this discussion of the, of the 1980s and try to persuade you that it is a decade worth looking at. Um, but I need to start by, by, by stepping back a bit and saying um, what happened immediately after independence is you've got buildings, indeed, like the Supreme Court, designed by Dialalika, um, which, as Swapna suggested, is a very bit backward-looking in a sense. I think they're, they're happy to pick up the threads where Lutyens left off and to try to do a slightly kind of updated version of the Lutyens New Delhi idiom, and in other, other buildings like the, the great Ashok Hotel in Shanakipuri, it's even more historicist. It's looking back to the approach of the indo saracenic movement at the end of the 19th century, where you have scrupulously copied historical forms worked into the modern design. Temple architecture is going on its own um, trajectory. It's saying, of course, that's the, the Lakshmi Narayan, so-called famous Biela Temple of, of, um, of uh, 
um, Mandy and Mark, um, also from the 1950s. Um, it's again very historicist, albeit with the changing technology. So that's the situation up until the mid-50s, and then everything changes because something that happens outside of Delhi, Chandigarh. You have this great beacon of modernism coming and building um, on the site. Um, we, we, we've lost it somehow. There it is. This is the, the, the Secretariat and part of the, the High Court in Chandigarh. Um, unless you're an architectural historian or an architect, it's difficult to convey the extraordinary impact that this had on a whole generation of Indian architects. They were suddenly shown what modernism should look like. And many of them worked closely with um, Le Corbusier while he was here, or indeed, in some cases, even um, in, in Paris. So what you get after Chandigarh in Delhi, next one please, is a whole succession of architects who simply ad adopt the Le Corbusier mode. And they start to use an entirely new imagery of architecture. So this is, was originally Akbar Hotel, it's now a university. Um, these are both designed by Shivnal Prasad um, and Tibet House, supposedly representing the Tibetan diaspora culture in Delhi. There's not a thing that's Tibetan about it. Um, it's entirely a, a, a modernist, um, Le Corbusier, brutalist uh, design. Next. Um, so there are many, many others. So this is, this is the, um, uh, the Oberoi Hotel, um, which I think is a rather successful example um, of, of international modernism, um, and Rathan Singh's Near Place, which is perhaps rather less successful, um, though much of that has to do with its, its use. But, so if you knew Delhi you know, at that time or subsequently, these, these buildings are very, very, very familiar. Next. Le Corbusier wasn't the only person to have an impact. The other was the American architect, Dewey Kahn, who was, of course, invited to design the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, and that had a similar effect, rather interesting one. So that is Ahmedabad. This, believe it or not, below, which looks almost exactly the same, as so it's a photograph of the same building. This is the extension to modern school designed by Sach uh, um, um, Jasbir and Rosemary Sachdev. Um, and obviously they, they, they've seen the images of, of the Indian Institute of Management and you get a similar kind of pastiche now of Louis Kahn rather than of Le Corbusier. Next. And it, that had an extraordinary effect actually um, in, in terms of the adoption of brick. Brick is a, it's not a modernist material, brick is an ancient material, but it has certain kind of modernist imageries or acquired them. Suddenly, brick had been used in India since the Indus Valley. No one had thought of building you know, important institutions out of exposed brickwork. That just wasn't done until Louis Kahn showed you that he could do it. And so you then get Jawaharlal Nehru University built entirely of brick in the original Cochrane plan. Um, and this, of course, is Satish Gujral's Belgian embassy, an ambassadorial building built of, of, of brick. So the whole, the whole value of brickwork changes because of Louis Kahn. There was then this moment, and this is why the 80s is important. Everybody sat back and they thought, are we really getting this right? I mean, are we actually just taking an undigested modernism and imposing it on our own country? Shouldn't we be rethinking international modernism for an Indian context? It was a moment when, anyway, some of the values of, of the international modern movement were being questioned in the West with the rise of postmodernist approaches. And all of those architects like... Um, um, the, the people I've been talking about, but also you know, Charles Corrier, I'll come to him in a minute, and Bibi Doshi, sat back and they thought, surely we should be doing it differently, but how? How can we do it differently? Because what they didn't want to do was to go back to the Indo-Saracenic movement. They didn't want to go into a sort of historicism or acidism. It had to be something that was both Indian and modern at once. But how could you do that when you've, you've, you've just come out of 200 years of colonialism and the international modern movement? How do you, how do you invent a distinctively Indian modernism. Had anybody got anywhere close to doing that? Well, in Delhi, yes, there had been two. One of them, strange enough, actually another foreigner, Joseph Allen Stein, who had, in wonderful buildings like this, the Shreveni Kala Sangam, um, near Mandi House, had used all of the technologies and, the, and the, the language of modernism, but had somehow managed to weld it with an Indian sensibility, particularly towards the, the integration of the garden and the building. There's a wonderful monograph on Stein called Building and the Garden. Um, and it's really an Indian idea that he's picking up on. And his, his friend and sometime co collaborator, um, Habib Rahman, um, had a very similar approach at the same time. Um, this, of course, is part of Rabindra Bhavan. So they, 
they in a sense showed that it could be done. And then others took up the, the, the theme. So next one, please. So I shall start with Correa. Uh, one of his most, uh, Charles Correa, of course, is his uh, practice was based in Bombay, but who did do a number of buildings in, in Delhi. Um, I don't think that the LIC building is perhaps most conspicuously successful if what you're trying to do is to invent a distinctively Indian modernism, because it just, it's, with its glass walls and its space frames, it was just catching up on all of the kind of cliches of modernism at the time internationally. And I have to say, this, this building, I, mean, I think it's interesting because the way in which Correa was talking about architecture at the time was immensely inspiring in the 1980s. And as a, as a student of architecture, uh, to a tie, it was all part of one kind of seamless Indian identity. Um, and then he put up this, and they were all felt terribly kind of let down. They thought, well, you know, what's happened to this time? But he was rather more successful, I think, than they say on this one. That, that, that is also by Correa, that's the British Council building. A little bit Le Corbusier, perhaps, in the front, though softened by the, the mural by Howard Hodgkin. But look at the back, the courtyard, and suddenly we get a whole new language, not this mural, a whole new approach, where you can actually see there are connections with Mughal architecture, with the courtyard approach to Mughal architecture, and, and, and the kind of um, materials that it used, the, the, the filtering of light that it used. So, a much more successful... Um, um, this is Doshi in, um, uh, in, in Delhi, the mint building, and his, from his practice, it's essentially his yeah, but worked on by others, but Doshi had been a very dyed-in-the-wool modernist, but here in the middle of Nif, New Delhi, he puts a step well. Isn't that fantastic? You get this kind of, almost kind of archaeological moment where you have a reference back to tradition. And C.P. Kukreja, who had been a Carnian and had built JNU entirely out of bricks, gets the tiles out. He puts the bricks away and he gets the tiles out. Ambadeep is like a kind of sultanate tower for our times. It looks like something that's come out of Bida. Um, an absolutely wonderful building of the 1980s. It's not well kept, unfortunately, but when it was sparkling new, my goodness, that was an amazing effect on the whole And then, this obviously is the most powerful building of the 1980s, again designed by a foreigner, by an Iranian architect, and part of a difficult, difficult, challenging commission that's because this, of course, is the Baha'i House of Worship. And one of the, although Baha'i is, I'm sure you all know, is a, an inclusive faith, um, it is not inclusive with respect to iconography. Part of the brief to the architect is you may not use any icon that has been from any of the religions from which it falls apart. So um, it's, you have to use almost an abstract architecture. Brilliant idea to use for the Lotus, which is, you know, is, is not an architectural thing, but a deeply embedded cultural one. I think for Westernize it's a little unfortunate the resemblance to the Sydney Opera House, but I don't think that, that, that has quite such an impact for, for Indian eyes. Next. The greatest of the, of, the, of the offices, as it were, of, of, of the, of the of Delhi architects is Raj Rewal. And I think he was someone who was most sincere, most hardworking in this idea of blending old um, in a housing scheme like the, the, the Asia, the, the Asian village um, for, for the, um, the sports event, where he's, he's using um, the urban forms of traditional Rajasthani towns like Jaisalmer. I'm going to run through the last couple of slides briefly. Thanks, one. Um, I think the only question that, that the people raised about the Asia was why Jaisalmer? I mean, you know, it's the wrong color. Okay, it's a simple point as that. So in the Scope building, this is a huge office complex for government-owned um, industries. Um, he reverted to the red and buff sandstone. And thereby, what Rajawal did is he, because he was using the same color scheme as Mughal architecture, he's sort of imprinting that kind of two-tone scheme as Delhi's signature imagery. And a lot of his buildings after that use this red and buff sandstone. It's, it's often reconstituted, actually. But that's the Scope office. And then a, more, a, more, a later building of his is the, uh, the headquarters of the, of the, of, of the World Bank um, in, the, in the Lodi estate. I would have liked to spend longer explaining the merits of these buildings too, but I've, I've shown you some images really, I think, to hope, in the hope of, of saying to you, you know, Delhi has a great moment architecturally, um, even in the, in, in the late 20th century. Um, a lot of the concerns that I've been talking about were things about identity. So trying to establish a modern Indian identity. Architecture didn't stand alone in it. The 1980s was also the decade of the festivals of India. These great international exhibitions where 
um, curators and craft specialists kind of thought about how do we represent India, what is India, uh, uh, how, how do we show it abroad, as it were, what do people to think of it. It was a very urgent question, it seemed at the time, it was a very serious question, and it's all sort of gone. Where did it go? Because it's not as though the answer was settled, as though we all agreed this is what Indian modernism should look like and we'll just get on with that now. It all just somehow dissipated with the emergence of with the liberalization. And I think, you know, there's much to be said for liberalization. I'm very happy, glad that it happened. But one of the things that, that it brought about was a fantastic um, acceleration of the development of Australia in ways that left kind of architecture, you know, could be architecture of any modern city of India. But in the context of a new politics of, I mean, new evolving politics of Delhi, which is more democratized and which might celebrate eventually the indigenous cultures, what sort of architecture could celebrate, let's say, Prithviraj Chavan, the last uh, ruler of uh, you know, the last indigenous ruler of Delhi, or Hayden. What sort of architecture could celebrate these figures, rather than, of course, the modern emerging architecture which could be found in any city of India or the world? Yeah. So that's my question. We don't have very much from Prithi Raj, except the walls, um, and, of course, the columns of temples we used in the, in the Quran of Islam. Um, and I don't think anyone would recommend going back to, you know, a sort of atavistic temple architecture as, as an inspiration for the kind of new buildings that we need, the new kinds of buildings that we need. I think one of the interesting things about um, Delhi's architecture is the way in which architecture of, of different dynasties refer back to each other, so that you you do you get a, a, a much more um, mixed kind of approach to to, to buildings. There aren't, as it were, a very distinct traditions. Would you agree with that? Um, so, um, I, I mean, I think that the, the, the best answer is, is the work of Raj Rewal. I mean, I showed a few of his things. I think something like Parliament Building draws on a great range of, of historic traditions, um, and yet it's, it's, it's distinctively modern. So that's, I would I'd like there to be more of that, but it, it, there doesn't seem to be other, I mean, many other architects working in that idiom. I mean, you know, in the sense that when people write of Delhi, they either write of British Delhi and the architecture of Mughal Delhi. But these are just the imperial aspects of Delhi. What about, I mean, the indigenous Delhi is hardly ever written about. That's my point. I, I wouldn't like to make those kind of distinctions between what is indigenous and what is uh, imperial because that is a whole new, uh, you know, I mean, to me, the Mughals are as indigenous as anybody else. I mean, they are, they are an Indian dynasty. So, anyhow, so, uh, you know, that, those are questions that, but I would agree with you that the architecture that we see, it's, it's an evolution of an Indian style that is happening in Delhi. I mean, you know, we are, we are seeing this happening. Of course, there are breaks and um, sort of important conjunctions like that, but it is, a, you know, so, uh, therefore, we have to find a way forward uh, and decide what we want to take forward from that.
mention evolution. And of course evolution there must be. Why must we slavishly follow what happened 100, 200, 300 years ago? I mean, we're talking of red sandstone, we're talking of beige, and we're talking of... In those days, materials that we have today were not available. We did not have air conditioning. Why should we, why should we not take advantage of what is available today? Make it attractive. Let's move forward. Why do we, why do we continue to look backwards? And, you see, Delhi today can evolve, you know, in whichever way uh, that the modern life and modern materials permit it. So, now, you see, Corbusier you know, did it 50 years ago, or 60, 70 years now, you know, and look, you know, what a beautiful city he made. I mean, why is it, why did he not try, I mean, if you know, that was so, then he'd go back to the sandstone and not use brick, you know, as he did. So it's a matter of balance, really. I'm not advocating going backwards, but looking back to go forward. It's a question of having a sense of, of, of identity, of indeed of not producing um, cities that, as the previous speaker said, you know, um, question has said, could be anywhere, buildings that could be any, anywhere in the world. Um, I think it's, it's by drawing inspiration from the past that you can, you can forge a, a, a distinctive um, idiom for the, for the future. That would be my prescription. Yes, I think we are uh, out of time on this one. Thank you very much.